Why do people do this? Why do they leave Islam? Why do they leave Iman? For kufr. Why do they disbelieve in Allah after believing in Him? Why do they deny the Prophet ﷺ after believing in Him? Thalika that is. بِأَنَّهُمْ Because indeed they استحبوا الحياة الدنيا على الآخرة They have preferred the life of this world over the hereafter. They love the life of this dunya more than the life of the hereafter. وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمَ الْكَافِرِينَ And indeed Allah does not guide those people who are disbelieving. So we see that apostates are mentioned in this ayah. Those people who leave Islam and adopt kufr for the sake of this world, for the sake of the benefits of this dunya. That a person is perhaps born in a Muslim family even. He is raised as a Muslim. He has a Muslim name. But when he sees the dunya, when he learns about a few things, when he gets a few degrees, when he goes outside, he gets so influenced by it, he falls in love with it, that he will also compromise his religion for that sake. To the point that he abandons the religion. He believed in Allah. And then he rejected the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unfortunately, this is becoming very common. Very common. That people who are raised as Muslims, they go and study something, and they lose their iman completely. They lose their belief completely. They don't even believe in the existence of God anymore. Why? What's the reason behind that? Because they prefer the life of this dunya over the hereafter. They have forgotten the hereafter. They have forgotten accountability. They don't think about the fact that they're going to be questioned about what they're doing. As a result, they do whatever they want. They say whatever they want about the Prophet ﷺ. They say whatever they want about the Qur'an. Whatever they want to say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without any hesitation. Without thinking twice. Because they have completely forgotten the hereafter. They don't fear accountability at all. And such a person who reaches such a level, such a stage, then what does Allah say? Allah does not guide such people. Because on them is the ghadab of Allah. Allah is angry with them and Allah does not guide them. Which is why many times such people do not repent at all. They don't change their ways. They only go deeper and deeper into their kufr. As we have learned earlier, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَأَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يؤمنون. خَتَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ سَمْعِهِمْ وَعَلَىٰ أَبْصَارِهِمْ غِشَاوَةً وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ And even over here, what do we learn? وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ That for them is a great punishment. So this is a person who leaves Islam for the sake of dunya. That he is influenced by the dunya and he leaves the religion of Allah completely. He becomes completely negligent of the hereafter. But on the other hand, there is a person who is forced to say words of kufr. Man ukriha, the person who has been compelled. And he has been forced to say certain words, but in his heart he is still a believer. Now when a person is in this situation, he does not become a kafir. You understand? He still remains a believer. When was this surah revealed? In Makkah. And remember in Makkah, the Prophet ﷺ, the Muslims were facing a lot of persecution. Becoming a Muslim, becoming a believer was like putting yourself in the fire. Because the situation was extremely intense. It was like come and attack my life, attack my wealth, attack my family, do whatever you want because I have become a Muslim. This is what it meant by becoming a Muslim. And we see that the believers were persecuted terribly. And we learned that two companions, Yasir and his wife Sumayya, radhiallahu anhuma, they were killed even. And their son, Ammar ibn Yasir, he was also persecuted. In front of him, his parents were killed. And remember, Ammar ibn Yasir, he was still young at that point. And he was persecuted very, very severely. To the point that he was told to say something that was a statement of kufr. And he said it, just to get out of that situation. He said the kalima kufr, just to get out of that situation. And obviously, he became very worried after that. Am I still a believer? Is my iman still acceptable? I just said it to get out of that situation. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ asked him, How did you find your heart? How did you find your heart? And Ammar said, Steadfast in faith. I was still a believer. I still feel confident about my iman in my heart. So the Prophet ﷺ told him not to worry. 
And he advised him that if necessary, you can repeat the same words to get out of the persecution. Because remember, it was a very, very tough situation. It was a very difficult situation. So we see that some Sahaba, obviously they were human beings. For them, it was extremely difficult to bear that persecution and to get out of that, they said Kalima Kufur. But in their hearts, they were firm on Iman. Only on the outward they showed Kufur. But at the same time, there were some Sahaba who remained firm despite the opposition that they were facing. Like for example, Bilal anhu. They inflicted all sorts of torture on him. They placed a huge rock on his chest while he was laying bare on the extremely hot sand. And they told him to say that Allah has partners. And he refused. And every time he would say, Ahad, Ahad. And he would say that by Allah, if I knew any word more annoying to you than this, I would say it. He would say, Ahad, Ahad. Because that is one word they could not hear. They could not tolerate the fact that Allah is only one God because their gods were being rejected. He never said Kalima Kufr. So the scholars, they have agreed that if a person is forced into disbelief, it is permissible for him to say words of Kufr just to get out of that situation. It is permissible. Why? Because we see the evidence of that in the Qur'an. We see the evidence of that in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, the story of Ammar ibn Yasir. So, for the sake of, in the interest of self-preservation, taqiyya, that is the term in Arabic, taqiyya, or self-preservation, in this situation, in order to preserve one's life, to preserve one's safety and security, a person may say such words. However, it is better, it is more preferable that a person does not even say those words and he bears that opposition with sabr, with patience. Because there were sahaba who never said any kalima like that. So really at the end of the day, it depends at the level of iman of the person. If the iman is stronger, then a person will bear those difficulties. But if a person feels that he cannot handle it anymore, then what should he do? He should say such words in the interests of self-preservation. And we see various examples from the lives of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ in which we see that they did not say Kalima Kufr even though they were put in an extremely difficult situation. For example, we learn that Musaylima Kadhab, the person who claimed to be a Prophet, he asked Habib ibn Zayd al-Ansari, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, that do you bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger of Allah? He said, yes I do. Then Musaylima asked him, do you bear witness that I am the messenger of Allah? So he replied, I do not hear you. Meaning, you're not a messenger. And Musaylima, what did he do? He kept cutting parts of his body, piece by piece. He would ask him, do you testify he's a messenger? Yes. Do you testify, I am a messenger? I do not hear you. And with every rejection, he would cut a piece of his body. Imagine a finger, a hand, a limb, another limb. He continued to do this until he died. Similarly, we learn that Abdullah ibn Hudayfa al-Sahmi, one of the companions, he said that he was taken prisoner by the Romans. Because remember, the Muslims were at war with the Romans at the time that the Prophet ﷺ passed away. And these Romans, they brought Abdullah عنه, to the king. And the king said, become a Christian and I will give you a share of my kingdom and my daughter in marriage. Abdullah said, if you were to give me all that you possess and all that Arabs possess to make me give up the religion of Muhammad, even for an instant, I would not do it. The king said, then I will kill you. Abdullah said, it's up to you. And the king, he gave orders that he should be crucified. And he commanded his archers to shoot near his hands and feet while ordering him to become a Christian. But he still refused. You know how people say that Islam spread with the sword? Look at how their people were. How Christianity must have spread. That they're forcing a person to become a Christian to such a point that they're threatening him that he's going to be killed. This is a lie that Islam has been spread by a sword. This is not how Muslims went and conquered their lands. They let people remain on their religion. 
and these Christian kings, this is how they persecuted the Muslims who came to them. So then the king, he gave orders that he should be brought down. Imagine, he said that, put him up in order to crucify him, and he commanded his archers, shoot him by his hands and feet, you know, threaten him so that he may become a Christian. But he refused. So then the king gave orders that he should be brought down, and that a big vessel made of copper be brought and heated up. A huge pot of copper, heated up with copper inside. So then while Abdullah was watching, one of the Muslim prisoners were brought out and he was thrown into that huge pot until all that was left of him was scorched bones. He melted inside. And the king ordered him again to become a Christian and he refused. Then he ordered that Abdullah be thrown into the vessel. And he was brought back to the pulley to be thrown in. Abdullah wept and the king hoped that he would respond to him. So he called him But Abdullah said, I only weep because I have only one soul with which to be thrown into this vessel at this moment for the sake of Allah. I wish that I had as many souls as there are hair on my body with which I could undergo this torture for the sake of Allah. And according to some reports, the king imprisoned him and he deprived him of food and drink for several days. And then he sent him wine and pork. Just imagine, he sent him wine and pork But Abdullah did not even come near that. So the king, he called him and he asked, What stopped you from eating? Abdullah said, It is permissible for me under these circumstances to eat pork, to drink wine, but I did not want to give you the opportunity to gloat. I didn't want you to be happy, to feel that you have been victorious over me. So the king finally, he accepted his defeat. And he said to him, Kiss my head and I will let you go. So Abdullah said, And you will also release all the Muslim prisoners? Is that a condition? The king said yes. So Abdullah kissed his head and he released him and all the other Muslim prisoners he was holding. And when he came back, Umar ibn al-Khattab, who was a khalifa at that point, he said, every Muslim should kiss the head of Abdullah ibn Hudayfa. And I will be the first one to do so. And he stood up and he kissed his head. May Allah be pleased with all of them. So what do we see? That one is that at the slightest thing, a person compromises the religion. He says things, he does things just to please the kuffar. And the other is that a person remains steadfast despite the hardship that he faces, despite the persecution that he undergoes. Yes, it is not impermissible to say kalima kufr in extreme situations. However, what is afdal? What is much better? That a person bears patiently. And in this is a lesson for us. That sometimes we want to compromise in the religion on the smallest of things. The person is going to look at me like this and they're going to say that and they're going to feel threatened and they're going to feel like this and they're going to feel like that. And because of that, we leave our salah. We ignore our religion. Will that be acceptable? Think about it. If the Sahaba is sacrificed at such a great level, we compromise on the slightest of things and at the same time, we want the same reward as them. We want the same Jannah as them. How is it possible? For deen, for iman, you have to sacrifice. You have to go against your nafs. You have to bear the difficulties. You have to face the opposition. And when you do that, then you're on surat al-mustaqeem. وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّ الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا Those people who do sabr, they will be given reward. But those people who compromise, those people who fall for this dunya, who willingly give up their religion for the sake of this dunya, Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ Those people are the ones who طَبَعَ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ Allah has set a seal upon their hearts. وَسَمْعِهِمْ And their hearing. وَأَبْصَارِهِمْ And their sights. وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْغَافِلُونَ And it is those who are the heedless. Such people are completely heedless. Of what? Of what is to be done to them. They are completely heedless of their akhirah. For the pleasures of dunya, they compromise their akhirah. They are completely ghafil. لا جرم assuredly there is no doubt that أنهم indeed they في الآخرة in the hereafter هم الخاسرون it is only they who are losers there is no doubt in this only such people are going to be losers who those who willingly give up their religion for the sake of this dunya they will have a painful punishment because they are heedless 
they are deprived of guidance because of their love of dunya. There is a seed upon their hearts and they will be losers. On the other hand, summa then, inna rabbaka, indeed your Lord, lilladina hajaru min ba'di ma futinu, for those people who migrated after they had been compelled, after they had been put to trial, after they had been persecuted. If you look at the word summa over here, what does the word summa mean? Then, after some time, so it shows a delay in time. And sometimes the word summa also shows the difference in position, in rank, in place. Over here, summa is not showing the delay in time, rather it is showing the board, the distance that is in rank, that is in position. That on the one hand, there are those people who are mentioned above, who, those who willingly give up their religion for the sake of this dunya. Who willingly compromise on their deen to such an extent that they have abandoned their religion just so that they can enjoy this dunya. Completely negligent of the hereafter. On the other hand, there are those people who go to the extent of leaving their homes for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They sacrifice for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are far apart in their rank, in their consequence, in their end result. For the one group, there is adabun azim, they are khasirun. And for the other group, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be ghafoor rahim will be forgiving and merciful to them. Who? Those people who hajaru min ba'di ma futinu. After they had been tormented. After they had been compelled to say words of kufr. But in their hearts, they were firm. So you understand the sacrifice? That first of all, they are bearing all the persecution for the sake of their religion. They don't say anything wrong. And even if they have to, in their heart, they are firm on iman. And then they leave their home country for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they don't stop there. They continue. Summa jahadu. Then they strive. They struggle in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They continue to increase in their iman. Wa sabaru. And they are patient. Inna rabbaka. Indeed your Lord. Min ba'diha. After it. La ghafurur rahim. Surely forgiving and merciful. If you notice, it's min ba'diha. Not min qabliha. It's after all that sacrifice that Allah will be forgiving and merciful. What do we want? That we don't have to do any sacrifice? That we can go on compromising on the religion? And we say Allah is ghafoorur rahim. Isn't it? So many times, we see our Muslim brothers and sisters compromising on their religion, and what do they say? Allah is ghafoorur rahim. But what do we learn? That after you do hijrah, after you do jihad, after you do sabr, then Allah will be forgiving and merciful to you. After you show that you are determined, that you are honest. It is said that this ayah is about those people who were oppressed in Makkah. And in that oppression, in that opposition, because of their weakness, they went on saying statements of kufr just to get out of that opposition. People like Ammar ibn Yasir and other Sahaba. So obviously they had this guilt in their heart. Think about it. A person is appearing to be disbeliever in front of some and in front of others he is a believer. Isn't that living a double life? But this was necessary for them in order to save their lives in interests of self-preservation for taqiyya. This was necessary for them. So obviously they had this guilt in their heart. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Now after this, make sure you do extra good. Hajaru, wajahadu, wasabaru. Because when you've made a mistake, then what should you do? Follow it by a good deed. Although this was not a mistake on their part, but this was a deed of a lesser degree. This was not sinful on their part. But it was not afbal. Therefore, do extra good, and Allah will be forgiving and merciful to you. On which day? Yawma ta'ti On the day when it will come. Who will come? Kullu nafsin. Every soul. Every person is going to come on the day of judgment. Whether he is a believer or non-believer. Whether he is righteous or sinful. And what is every person going to be doing? Tujadilu an nafsiha. It is going to be disputing for itself. Tujadilu from Jida. Each person is going to be arguing, is going to be debating. For itself. 
What does it mean by this? In order to free itself. Every person is going to be occupied by himself only. No one else is going to come and defend him. Each person is going to be left on their own on that day. وَتُوَفَّى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ And every person will be given in full. مَا عَمِلَتْ Whatever it did. وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ And they will not be wronged. We see that on the Day of Judgment, each person will be making a case in his own defense. No one is going to come and say, let me fight your case. Give me this much money and I will fight your case. No one is going to do that. Each person is going to be concerned only about himself. Not about his mother, not about his father, not about his sister or his wife or his own son or his own daughter. People whom he fought for in the dunya, he will abandon them on the day of judgment. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ Because لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ شَأْنٌ يُغْنِيهِ Every person on that day, he will be occupied with something that is going to busy him. Meaning he is going to be completely negligent of others. So what do we see in this ayah? Why is this mentioned right after? Kufr and Iman. What do you think about this? What's the connection between the two? Generally, if you think of it, people will compromise on their religion for the sake of who? Other people. What does Allah say? All these people are going to leave you tomorrow. Today they tell you, leave your religion, we will give you this position. Compromise on your deen, we will give you this much money. We will give you this job. You will get this and this. You will establish relationships, you will establish links, and see how you will be successful in your career, see how you will be successful in your dunya. Compromise. But what does Allah say? Tomorrow, no one is going to come and rescue you. No one is going to come and help you. That yes, I told you to do such and such, I will take the sin of that. No, you're going to be left on your own. We listen to the recitation and then we'll continue. Men. Don't get lost in the things of this dunya. Don't love them so much that you compromise on his religion because of these things. Because these things are temporary. Ma'indakum yanfat. It's going to finish eventually. So even if you get the entire world at the cost of your iman, it is not enough. Because it is temporary. In the hereafter, you'll be left on your own. None of these things will accompany you. It's going to be your deeds. It's going to be what you did. What you accomplished. That is what's going to be looked at. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا And Allah presents an example. Of who? قَرْيَةً Of a city. Meaning, the people of a city. كَانَتْ آمِنَةً It was secure. Amina from Aman. There was Aman. Security. Peace. The city was very peaceful. How? That the people of that city did not feel any threat from any raids, any possible raids, any armies coming and attacking them, trying to overtake them. Their peace was never disturbed. The people of that city were saved from the enemy, saved from any battle, any war, or any kind of hunger, saved from the fear of being taken as captives. Amina, peaceful and secure. Mutma'innatan, satisfied, content. Meaning, very content and happy with their city. Nothing was short, nothing was less in that city. They never thought of leaving that place, going somewhere else, because of not finding a job, because of not having enough food to eat. They were well settled over there. Ya'tiha, it comes to it. What comes to that city? Rizquha, its provision. How? Rahadan, abundantly, in profusion. From where? Min kulli makanin from every place. Meaning every regional and seasonal produce would come to that city. From every place and of every season. Fruits, produce were brought to that city. How? In abundance. So basically, people of that city never experienced any hunger. But what did the people do? Fakafarat. But it disbelieved, it denied, it was ungrateful. For what? Bi an'um for the blessings of Allah. An'um, plural of ni'mah. They were ungrateful for these blessings of Allah. Which blessings? Aman, itmi'nan, rizq. 
So what happened? فَأَذَاقَهَ اللَّهُ So Allah made it taste. What? The city, meaning? The people of that city were made to experience لِبَاسَ الْجُوعِ The clothing of hunger, the clothing of starvation. وَالْخَوْفِ And fear. Why? بِمَا كَانُوا يَصْنَعُونَ Because of what they used to do. الْجُوع is starvation. What does it mean by libas al ju'i wal khawf? That they were made to wear clothing of hunger and fear. This is an expression which means that hunger and fear enveloped them, completely covered them just as a garment covers someone. And just as a garment, it is close to your body, when you're wearing it, it does not just fly off easily. Similarly, libas al-ju'i wal-khawf, hunger and fear were on these people constantly. And they suffered from this famine for seven years. And they suffered from this fear for many more years. Why? Bima kanu yasna'oon, because of the actions that they used to do. Which city is this? The city of Makkah. And who is being referred to? The people of Makkah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them so many blessings. Peace, security, contentment. Despite the fact that it was in the middle of the desert. Wadin غَيْرِ ذِي zar, Nothing grows over there. But still, every regional and seasonal produce was brought to that city. And the people of that city never feared any famine, any hunger, any enemy, any insecurity. Because the people of that city were well respected by entire Arabia. But what happened? They were ungrateful for these blessings. How? That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet ﷺ to them, what did they do? They rejected him. So in return, Allah replaced their blessings with what? The blessing of aman and itmi'nan was replaced with jur and khawf, hunger and fear. What was this hunger? They suffered from a famine for seven years. Seven years. And khawf, what was that fear? That when people would come in to Makkah, when the pilgrims would come in, when the various people would come in, there was this fear, are they going to bring any produce at all? Are they going to bring any food at all? Similarly, this fear was also the fear of the Muslims. Because when the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Makkah to Medina, the mushrikeen of Mecca, they were constantly in fear. Constantly, which is why we see them coming and fighting the Muslims at Badr, at Uhud, at Khandaq, and all those battles that took place until eventually they were conquered. Why did this happen? That their blessings were replaced with difficulties. Bima kanu yasna'oon, because of what they used to do. What's the lesson in this for us? That if Allah has given many blessings to a person, and if a person is ungrateful, then what happens? Those blessings are taken away from him. Shukr leads to increase. And kufr leads to decrease. Shukr leads to growth of blessings. And ingratitude leads to reduction of blessings. Loss of blessings. And again remember that having blessings and not having blessings does not only mean that a person has many material things or he lacks material things. What does it mean? That a person does not have contentment in his heart anymore. He does not have satisfaction in his heart anymore. He is not relaxed. He is always worried, always tensed. He is not happy. He is always concerned. When does this happen? When a person is far from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a person has been ungrateful for the blessings that he has been given. وَلَقَدْ جَاءَهُمْ And certainly he came to them. Who? Rasulun, a messenger. Min whom from them? Meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has come to them as a messenger. Who is from among them? A Qurayshi, Arab, just like themselves. But, فَكَذَّبُوهُ But they denied him. فَأَخَذَهُمُ الْعَذَابُ So the punishment seized them. وَهُمْ ظَالِمُونَ While they were wrongdoers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them of this blessing that has been sent to them. Of who? The messenger. لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعَثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ 
The messenger was from among themselves. They recognized him. But still they rejected him. They came up with many excuses, many justifications, many objections. They refused to believe in him. What did Allah do? He took those blessings away from them. They were deprived of hayat and tayyibah. And they were given a life that is full of fear and hunger. And here we need to reflect as well. That all these blessings that we're enjoying every single day, what is our attitude? Is it of gratitude or ingratitude? When we use these blessings, do we increase in our obedience? Or do we go on listening to shaitan? If we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then definitely we'll be happy. If we disobey Allah, if we befriend shaitan, if we are ungrateful for those blessings, then we will be unhappy. We will never be content. We will never be satisfied. Recitation. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا قَرْيَةً كَانَتْ آمِنَةً مُطْمَئِنَّةً يَأْتِيهَا رِزْقُهَا رَغَدًا مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ فَكَفَرَتْ From so much hunger that it is said that when they would slaughter their camels they would mix the hair with the blood. Why? in order to preserve the blood. And they would not leave any part of the camel. They would even consume the blood. They were so hungry. They had nothing. Because remember, Makkah, nothing grows over there. Everything has to be brought from outside. So Allah deprived them of that risk as a consequence of their ingratitude. That their messenger was made to leave that city. And eventually, they were finished. How? That shirk was completely eliminated from Makkah. Makkah was conquered and Tawheed was established over there. So what have you learned from these ayat? If you look at it, sometimes we hear about stories where people were taken as slaves, where their freedom was taken away, they were made slaves, and we feel really bad for them. But we need to reflect on our lives as well, that how many times is it that the blessings that Allah has given us, we don't use them properly? We don't obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that, we are becoming slaves to this dunya. That instead of using this dunya to earn our akhirah, we are selling ourselves to this dunya, for this dunya, which is only temporary. We feel bad for others, but we don't reflect on ourselves and feel bad for ourselves. Think about it. A person who has invested everything of his on something that is not going to bring him any profit. Feel so bad for him. But in reality, many times that is our case. We are investing our time, our energies in something that is useless. The reason behind ingratitude is because we don't even recognize the blessings. We don't even see them as blessings. We take them for granted. We say, oh, this is a part of life. Like the people of Makkah, perhaps they never thought this was a blessing of Allah until it was taken away from them. The fact that now, you know, we have this challenge of doing the lesson seven times. And for me, I was finding it so hard, subhanAllah. But now in seeing this, how dare I make excuses when they were tortured and they went through all this and they still, you know, they persevered. What right do I have to say I can do it seven times? And then the other point I was thinking about was for the people who leave belief and go to disbelief. You know, I was just thinking, it's so important for us even now as mothers to train our children not to have an attachment to the dunya because when you think about it, this all stems from that. If everything your child asks you, you give, you give, you give, what are you saying? That this dunya is more important than your akhirah. So for me, it's a lesson that, you know what, yes, there are things you can give them, but teach them that they're more important things and teach them from now that, you know, these are the consequences. If you value this dunya more, then these are the consequences of your hereafter. Exactly. That unfortunately, every time a child does something good, we give them a candy, we give them something which makes them feel that, yes, my goal in life is to get a candy, my goal in life is to get something that is going to bring me immediate pleasure, immediate benefit. This is teaching them something that is not beneficial for them. We should teach them what delayed gratification is, what sabr is, what sacrifices, only then they'll be able to apply this at a later stage in life, at a greater level. And whether you have nuclear power or you have anything, eventually it's going to go. So what's the pride about? 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I was thinking that our deen is really made easy for us. Like even if someone forces yeah. you to say something, you're still allowed and given permissibility. Yes. But obviously having patience is the best thing, inshallah. Exactly. This shows the ease that is in our religion. This Qur'an is actually the biggest niyama of all the niyamas up till now Allah SWT has mentioned us. When what is our relationship toward this Qur'an? Yes. Because this is the one who makes our life hayatan tayyibah. Exactly. But because we are away from it, we are so much lost into the other things to have the contentment and as a result, we are not happy. Yes. We are complaining all the time. Yes, because if you think of it, the people of Makkah, they weren't necessarily ungrateful for the food that was brought to them or the city of Makkah, the pleasures, the status that they enjoyed over there. They were ungrateful for the blessing of religion, of deen, of hidayah, of Quran, of the messenger. And when they turned away from that, their blessings were taken away from them. So similarly, if we leave the Qur'an, if we turn away from it, if we abandon it, if we stay away from it, our life is not going to be happy. We're going to be deprived of blessings. Last comment? Just an uh, example from turning from belief to unbelief. And I witnessed, I was really scary. In grade 12, my biology teacher, she had a Muslim name and everything. She was a good teacher, mashallah. So I think it was Eid was next day or like in two days. So I just saw my Eid Mubarak just in advance. And she's like, yeah, Eid Mubarak to you too, but I'm actually not a Muslim anymore. I turned uh, to Buddhism or something. And the reason was, she's like, I just don't agree with a few things. So I just turned to Buddhism. And I was like, so it's so just like just how it says, most of them just don't know the reality of the Quran. Just because you don't agree, you're just going to challenge the Quran and just say, you know, I'm just going to convert. I really don't agree with everything. And many times it's the ignorance that people have of the religion of Allah, which is why they leave it. They have not studied the deen, they have not studied the Qur'an, and they go on studying many other things, and they cannot understand them, they cannot understand their religion anymore because they haven't studied their religion. So if a person has the time, the capacity in their mind to go and take a very difficult degree, then they should also have the time and mind to study the Qur'an, to know their religion first. Let's listen to the recitation of these verses. وَإِذَا بَدَّلْنَا آيَةً مَكَانَ آيَةٍ وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا يُنَزِّلُ قَالُوا قَالُوا إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُخْتَرٍ بَلْ أَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته